Welcome to the second Entre Nous discussion of the autumn. I'm Alice Cram. I'm head of all adult cultural programming at the American Library in Paris. Tonight, we're delighted to be here to hear a talk about three archives in conversation. Before I hand over to Marie, who will introduce Jao, Mila, and Lynette, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Entre Nous series and also preface an upcoming discussion that's going to happen later this month. It will happen virtually um, between Gayatri Spivak and Emily Apter on November 29th. Um, so we'd really encourage you to join us for this conversation, which is part of an ongoing series that the Library, um, Columbia Global Centers Paris, and the Institute for Ideas and Imagination have created. It's been going on for kind of a year and a half by now. Tonight's conversation, we're really happy, is part of this series. Um, I also wanted to say that there's this kind of lovely English language hub. Um, there's also the American Library, which we're in the seventh arrondissement with the largest English language lending library on the European continent. Um, so if you know about us, that's fantastic. If this is the first time you're hearing about us, um, do check us out online or come visit us. We're right by the Oeuvre Tower. It's very hard to miss us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, pl so do, yeah, do kind of um, check out the, the Spivak and Emily Apter event later this month and also come see us at the library too. Um, we hold events like this and uh, it would be lovely to see you. Thank you. And I'll pass over to Marie. Um, thank you, Alice. Um, oh, this is a weird angle. Uh, well, we've, we've been fortunate enough to collaborate with the library and Séverine Martin at the Global Centers on the Entre Nous series for a couple of years now. And I'd like to extend my thanks to James Allen, Justine Benedette, Andrew Wells, and Samantha Senge at Reed Hall, whose energy and creativity and attention to detail have shaped this series and made it a huge success both here and uh, at the library by the Eiffel Tower, where you are very much encouraged to go. It's a wonderful place. I've, I've lost my, uh, it really is. It's a really um, wonderful resource. Our fellows use it a lot, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to collaborate with you guys. Um, so as Alice says, I'm Marie Dorigny. I run the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination, uh, where we have the rare privilege of spending time with exceptional people year after year. Time is a malleable thing when it comes to the COVID class of fellows, otherwise known as the forever fellows. <laughs> um, it's the class that came right after the lockdown when we had curfews and the restaurants were shut down and Joao and Ersi turned the Institute's kitchen into a little bistro uh, and cooked. He here are three of our forever fellows. We didn't know when they would actually come or how long they could stay, but these three people here decided they wouldn't budge until they had to. <laughs> Lynette pointed out earlier that theirs was their archives class, and um, it's true that practically everyone in their group was digging away in archives. A professor at Columbia University and an architectural historian and practitioner with a fo focus on sustainability Lynette pieces together layers of a story from different contexts and different textures. She'll turn anything into a forensic architectural project. If you're around this spring, she'll be here building a degradable... Biodegradable. Bio, degradable. sorry, sorry, biodegradable <laughs> eco bench shed construction right there in the garden somewhere. I, you know, I want to check it out. I'm sure you will too. Um, the book that Lynette wrote uh, here at the Institute is just out. It's called Year Zero to Economic Miracle, Hans Schwippert and Sepp Roof in Post-War West German Building Culture. Yeah. It's a complicated title. I know. But <laughs> I'll promise you my book, the title will be easy. Yeah, OK, <laughs> thank you. I won't spoil it. <laughs> So in her spare time in Paris, although I, I hesitate to use those words because Lynette doesn't exactly do spare time, <laughs> uh, she devised a microclimate map of Reed Hall and the varying temperatures on the walls and in the garden 
and then the buildings and the reflection of the sun on different textures because why not? She also did a blueprint of the building and what goes on in here and when people are working and chatting and turned this drawing into a postcard. And she's the one who became the post, the, began the postcard tradition at the institute where fellows are now encouraged uh, to make postcards with whatever image they want to do. And the idea behind it from Lynette was to disseminate physical evidence through the mailbox all over the place. And those will become archives in their own time, soon enough. Um, Mila Torelli, a good documentary filmmaker, followed soon after with this postcard. <laughs> Mila breaks the longevity record at the Institute. I think you did a full two years, <laughs> Mila. <laughs> And we're extremely proud of her two films, the La Budovich Reels and Cine Guerrillas. One of them pre pre um, premiered at TIFF, the TIFF fe festival, and the other is about to premiere at uh, EDFA. Oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> In Amsterdam this weekend. <laughs> um, and we're very proud because both of them, as I said, were edited here. We were privy to the many versions of these films as Mila drowned under an excess of materials and grappled with conversations with fellows and sessions with students, which posed the question of context and storytelling. Anyone who was around last year has seen one of these. I know it's very small. It's not exactly a postcard. Yet. Yet? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's an, an image that tells a long story I won't spoil it. I'll just say that there's an expression in French that comes from one of the earliest films in history by the Lumière brothers. It's called La Roseur Arrosé, which literally the, means the sprinkled waterer. Joao is a photographer who one day opened a box in his parents' apartment containing old photos taken by his grandparents, a trove that it turns out had tremendous historical weight. Joao liked it here though his office was clearly too small. <laughs> he pasted hundreds of photos on the walls and spilled into the hallways. Everyone got a chance to see the book becoming a book, the boxes being emptied, the images being aligned, the thoughts organized. All of these projects handle archives very differently and the materials and media are also used in a very different way. How do you explain an archive? What gets saved? What's the story? Who has a right to tell it? These are conversations Mila, Mila, Joao, and Lynette have had for months on end. And for you, they'll pick up where they left off a while ago, upstairs in the kitchen. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here tonight. I'm. Lynette, um, thank you, Alice, and thank you, Marie. I spent, uh, I think, bi-weekly Saturday afternoons in the American Library here while I was a fellow, and um, Marie, your introduction was not only lovely, but I certainly do spare time, so don't worry. <laughs> um, I'll get started, and then each of us will do a few minutes of an overview so that you as the audience have some idea of what our work looks like because to talk in the abstract about archives is the kind of opposite, I think, of the way we've worked with the different archives that we've had. So um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just launch in. So um, you probably, if you walked here, recognize this. That was, I arrived in Paris and it started snowing. And everyone said it never snows in Paris, and it continued to snow in Paris. Um, but that was, oops, and I got it backwards. Maybe I've got it backwards. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. That was the context. This was the other context I was working with, which were printouts and books and 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 um, photocopies and PDFs of research that I'd been doing for. I don't know, probably seven or eight years. And it had coalesced more or less into an academic manuscript. But um, there was more that I wanted to tell. Um, and I think a lot of the reason that I ended up writing the book as I did has to do with having been here. And these are just some images from the book. It might look like a pretty standard architectural book, and that's part of the story. but. Um, one of the things that I think it's important always to remember about architects is that while other 
uh, white collar professions like to delegate work that they find below their skill level. Architects delegate work that they don't have the skill to do, which is building. And that turns architecture into, you could describe it as distributed authorship, but it's really a network of authors working together. And it's that story that's most often left behind, if not repressed, when telling the story of architecture. So for me, to think architecture through its making uh, was important, and it was a story I couldn't tell without these very specific archives. So um, just to give you a sense with some pages of the book, the kind of archives I worked in, there were the sort of official state archives. The men in the photograph are uh, two of the architects I wrote about at a buffet celebrating the Brussels World's Fair in 1958. That was a kind of sort of standard history, right? Um, I also worked with bequests of architects that were left in um, institutions. That is uh, the galley of a book that was supposed to be published and was never published for the Parliament building built in 1949. And by 1950, the enthusiasm for the building had kind of run out, unfortunately, so the galleys remained nothing more than that. Um, I also found archival material through conversation. Uh, Natalie Dubois, who was the very first woman design partner for the behemoth corporate architecture firm Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, that really evolved in the post-war period granted me an interview, and at the end of the interview, she went into her own collection of photographs from her year in Germany in uh, 1952 and sent me these photographs with the annotation, the men in the lab coats are the Germans. Um, I also had a pretty amazing experience with this building in East Berlin. It had been the main cathedral of the Catholic Archbishop of Berlin. It ended up on the east. The bishop was in the west. The building was renovated uh, beginning in 1956 by one of the architects I studied who lived in Dusseldorf um, over a seven year period. And by chance, I ended up in the, um, in the charter house of the cathedral with the guy who took care of the furnace who told me, you know, I have some files downstairs, would you like to see them? And it was three binders full of requisitions for metal scaffolding and requests for visas and uh, sample notes for different developers of stained glass. And again, these are buildings that have been studied, but they've never been studied through the act that they're making. And one of the other things to remember about architecture is that once the building is done, the ephemera that leads to its making disappears as quickly as the names of the people who have built it. So the last archive I want to talk about briefly is a family archive. And this is a pretty remarkable story. So um, one of the two architects, Sepp Roof, um, had two children, a boy and a girl, both of whom became architects. Neither of them took over his office uh, upon his death, but all the content of his architect, of, of his office, was moved to the house he'd built for his family. And, you know, this is a sort of a similar view of that same moment in the building. Um, I could have studied it spatially, but because I had original detail drawings, but also fabricators' drawings, et cetera, it was a moment to think about the meaning of that one particular detail in a very early post-war building. Um, and these are the two women who saved the archive. The woman in the front is his daughter. The woman in the back is also his daughter, but by adoption, because he was, she is his granddaughter, and um, his granddaughter, his daughter, um, for whatever reason, in Catholic Bavaria didn't have a husband, so he adopted his own daughter. And they lived together in this amazing house. But um, if I can find the right page, I insisted that there be a band in my <laughs> book. Um, so I'm going to read you a few paragraphs of the book to give you a sense of 
why this archive was significant to me, but also how I tried to describe it in language that is not the typical language of writing about architecture. Um, without so much as minimal abridgment, the content of Sepproof's architectural office in Munich was transported upon his death in 1982 to the house he had designed exactly 30 years earlier for his family on Lake Tegern, some 50 kilometers away. The volume of documents would certainly have made the move an enormous undertaking. All of it remains intact in the custody of his daughter, Note Borga, an architect who worked for her father, and her daughter, Elizabeth, whom Ruth adopted, making him a father figure to both. My first visit to the house overlooking the Tegernsee lasted a summer afternoon. Steady rain slipped through weak spots in the roof and fell into pails that Elizabeth had placed with precision around the living room. For hours, I leafed through complete sets of project documents, invoices, sketches and margins, telephone notes, complete working drawings, everything that comprises the life of an architectural project. Reaffirming what the family anecdotes and stories suggested, these documents conveyed how Roof and his office ran projects, how he adapted what the building industry could offer, why he might decide to construct a portion of a building in wood, but the rest in concrete and steel, how he held others to account. The Roofs sat with me, chatting. We interrupted work only once mid-afternoon for strong coffee and homemade plum cake. When I visited the roofs with my friend, photographer Thad Russell, who did all the photos for the book, in January of 2019, a temporary shelter dominated the house from the outside. The Regional Historic Preservation Agency had staged an emergency intervention to keep the rain out and the snow off. Seen from the outside, the structure overwhelmed the architecture of the house. On the inside, though, the spaces were again dry, including the two main floor bedrooms that hold the archive. Although the purpose of our 2019 visit was to secure images of drawings that appear in this book, Thad and I asked the Roof Daughters permission to photograph more, not only their possessions, but also the traces which their lives leave among them, what Walter Benjamin called the chaos of memories and which adhere to the highest because least instrumental form of collection. So from that chaos came then the order of the book. <laughs> and with that, I will pass to you, Joel. Thank you, Lynette, and thank you, everybody, for being here, and especially to the Reed Hall. It's very good to be back home. <laughs> uh, and although they call us the Forever Fellows, I'm like, I'm planning, I'm cooking a plan to like just come here as a termite and <laughs> they won't notice me. Is that a termite? Uh, well, yeah. Because the termite eats the building. But you need to pamper me so I don't <laughs> eat the building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, but I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so what I'm showing is actually the continuation of what I was doing here for the last year and a half before I moved away. Uh, and it's the, this idea that brought me here in the first place of how to deal with your own family history and how that can be projected to the history of a place, a history of a country, a history of an, a former empire, and a political history of Europe in a way. So I was ra born and raised in Portugal, which holds the record for the longest dictatorship in the 21st century in Western Europe. We had lived under with 48 years of fascism. And what very little people know is that during those 48 years, actually 34 of them, we had a concentration camp in Cape Verde, which is back then uh, part of the Portuguese empire. And that, Cape, uh, that concentration camp was in a little village called Tarrafal, therefore the, the title. Uh, to make a very long story short into five minutes, this fine, beautiful gentleman that you're seeing actually is my grandfather, and he was sent there in 1949. And he was sent there for political reasons, as everybody who was sent to Tarrafal was. And he was a member of the Portuguese Communist Party, and without his sentence, he was sent to the camp. And the extraordinary thing was that after he arrived in September 49th, his parents were given permission to visit him. 
because they could, meaning they had the right resources, financial resources, and they had the right connections in Portugal's fascist regime to grant them those, that permission. And the absolutely extraordinary thing they did was when they did go and visit, after a lot of writing back and forth, and here are some of the telegrams that they were, would send to each other every week, uh, but upon their visit in December 1949, and for the ones who can't read Portuguese, I'll just translate. Very, pr very happy with the uh, with the trip. I need you to inform what's the plan to face your the possibilities uh, of helping you out here. Believe me, I don't need anything besides photographs of all the families. This is to me the starting point of an absolutely extraordinary thing, which is my great-grandfather, who was blind of an eye, decided to go to Cape Verde and to bring a Roliflex camera. And they started to photograph all the living prisoners who were in the camp. And upon their return to Portugal, they went around all, all the country and visited every single family to deliver these photographs. And while they were doing that, they also took photographs of the families that they were visiting in order to send the photographs back to the camp. So, as Marie mentioned, three years ago, I opened this Pandora's box where I knew there were some things from the family and I knew there were some things from this trip because my mom had been keeping it for a very long time. But I had no idea what was inside. She mentioned, oh, there are some prints and some negatives. And basically, there, w there are 800 negatives from not only the trips to the camp, but the travels inside of Cape Verde, the families, daily life they were, they were doing in Portugal and sending the pictures to the camp as my grandfather was there. Uh, and so, obviously, I fell firstly in a bit of a state of shock because then I got that, and pardon my French, that sensation is like, fuck, now <laughs> what do I do? And I've, I'm, I'm, I have my share of being inside of archives and convincing archivists that the paper and the text and the words are important, but usually there are that thing called photographs that's sitting there in the box and nobody cares for them. And that's usually where my interest lays. So I have this double responsibility of having this amazing archive that's been sitting there for 70 years and it has, been, it has not been treated by anyone, by historians, by politicians, by photographers. So I have this sort of different task of trying to decipher it in a way that is interesting for the history of my country, the history of the liberation movement in Africa, the history of fascism in Europe. But at the same time, I'm a photographer, so what's my role here? So what I've actually been doing, and these are the photographs of the graves where my grandmother, my great grandmother was deposing flowers. And therefore on, the back, on their return, they would also visit the families and give them the pictures because there were no official deaths. So the families did not know their loved ones had died. Uh, so there's all this raw and very rough material that I started identifying and taking notes on the prints. And most importantly t for me as a photographer and not dealing with my own photographs, it was like, what is my role here? And I decided to pay an homage to photography in a sense. How come 70 years after the fact, I have these materials in my hands? The, m the photographs that I make today, I have no idea if there's a hard drive that's going to reach the next 70 years that can be readable and those images are going to be treated how. So this is where I push back and say, okay, let me go back to the darkroom. So I grabbed these photographs that you're seeing here and I went back to the darkroom to print or reprint uh, these images on silver gelatin prints that will last at least the next 200 years if there's no floods or fires or earthquake out of the end of the earth because of global warming. But now they're like projected also towards the future, which I don't know all the Im immense ma massive photographs that we take every day now with our phones, what's going to happen in the future for that. So that was my little photographer self talking to my inner self was like, how can we continue to project his work? Uh, at the same time, there's the history and the stories of these people. So 
I've been going back to some of these families, interviewing them, trying to understand what went on after these photographs were taken, if someone still remembered these photographs being delivered. Little details like that that are now being built upon a book which, like uh, Lynette, w is a very complex, multi-layered, uh, and I'm like deep breathing because I've been trying to make this <laughs> into a book for like a year and a half, and I'm like, okay, keep going, keep going, keep going, and the Institute really gave me the luxury of time for that, uh, and now I'm like closer to, to having a book. Uh, or closer than ever, I would say. Uh, but just continuing to, to explain, this was my way into these works. And then finally, that's that thing that normally people pay attention when they're in archives, the word. So a big part of what I was doing here was actually to read through the letters that they wrote to each other every day for every single day that my grandfather was in the camp, they were writing to each other. Obviously very subtle, to, so they could pass on censorship, but there's some very interesting details there, not only about daily life in the camp, but about, for example, the Korea War, which was happening exactly at the time where my grandfather was there, and some like interesting analysis, and some very funny notes, some very, very humorous notes that one wouldn't think of when we think of a concentration camp. But it was also, historically speaking, a moment where Portugal needed to give away some signs of openness because the UN had been formed and there was pressure for decolonization and all that forward. So they, they, and my theory is one of the reasons why they allowed the camp to be visited by my grand grandparents was because of that pressure and like, yeah, we even allowed the families in. Uh, so the camp was then closed in 1954 for Portuguese political prisoners and reopened in 1962 when the so-called colonial war started. The liberation war for Angola, Cape, uh, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau and Mozambique, they reopened the camp for African political prisoners, which a lot of them are still alive. So now my work as a photographer and not as a, an archivist is to bridge this former photographs to the current situation. So that's what I've been doing over the last three years is to build those bridges and here's an example. Uh, but here's another one, which is the camp today as it's seen. And I'm trying to, this is another of the multi-layered things that I'm trying to do in the book, which is to play the old photographs with the new photographs, with the political photographs, with the family photographs, with the stories of everybody, plus the letters, plus all of that, so wish me luck because I'm going to need <laughs> some. Uh, but just to leave you on a, a, nice, a nicer note, these are the landscapes of Cape Verde today and how now a country that is fully democratic, independent, yet with a lot of struggles on their own is pushing forward and Portugal is pushing forward and backwards regarding this new wave of fascism that's going on through all the world, the world, but especially in Europe. But I think we're so far in a good place. So I'm leaving that with a hopeful note and passing it on to Mila. Thank you very much. Um, instead of focusing on one particular project, I wanted to take you on a tour of the way my approach to archives has changed over the years that I've been making documentary films. And I think an interesting starting point for me would be um, a morning when I went to Washington DC, I went to present one of my documentary films there, and I ended up, which is very rare for me, going for a morning run, and ran by a building that has such an incredible inscription on it that I had to stop and take a photograph, and only later did I realize what the building was. And um, it was the National Archives building in Washington which has this inscription and it's kind of chiseled in stone. It says, this building holds in trust the records of our national life and symbolizes our faith in the permanency of our national institutions. And I have to say to you that I found the certainty of um, inscribing such a text, chiseling such a text into the side of a building almost arrogant. And this comes from the fact that I was born and grew up uh, in Yugoslavia and I was 11 years old when the country disintegrated into civil war, and by the time that war ended and we had become seven small countries, I was 21. And so speaking about uh, our national life and permanency were words that really kind of resonate for me. 
So already with my first documentary film, which was called Cinema Comunisto, and these are stills from the film, um, I was looking at this idea of what happens to the archive of a country when it breaks apart and disappears. And basically, when Yugoslavia broke apart, an agreement was signed among the successor states. Um, Annex D of that agreement stipulates what will happen to the archives of the former Yugoslavias. The problem is that even though this agreement was negotiated at the end of the war, so at this point almost 20 years ago, it was never ratified by all of the countries, which means that archives belonging to former Yugoslav republics are today in some kind of gray zone of, if you like, orphan works, and they're in some kind of legal, uh, legal vacuum. And this process has been accompanied by a purposeful, intentional erasure of memory of the former Yugoslavia, and here I found one image that I think really symbolizes that process, which is that street names were changed, public holidays were changed, my school name was changed. So there was this very intentional process in the successor countries of the former Yugoslavia to erase, to erase its past. Um, and with the erasure of its past came the erasure of its stories. So one of the scenes in my first film in Cinema Comunisto takes place inside this building, which is the military museum. It's also the oldest museum in Serbia, which tells you a lot about our country's history and story. But the second floor of this museum was devoted in, entirely devoted to the Second World War, because the Second World War was the genesis story for the communist Yugoslavia. Um, and by the time I filmed the scene there for my first film, it had been closed to the public for about six years. And the reason that it was closed to the public is that the Serbian government had told the museum authorities, and it was um, ran by the Serbian army, that the story of the Second World War was told too much from a communist perspective. And they needed to decommunize, if you want, the story of, of the exhibition. And because the army said, OK, tell us how you want us to tell the story of the Second World War, and the Serbian government really had no reply to that question, um, they simply closed off the floor of the museum. And it stayed like that for about 10 years. So it's really this idea of orphan archives not really belonging to anybody, and, of a, and also orphaned of a narrative, if you like, that really pushed me to start working on archives as a filmmaker particularly inspired by this um, idea um, by the historian Pierre vidal Naquet that between the lost past and the found time lies a work of art. And for me, that was the kind of way through this hole of forgetting, if you like. So my first film, as I mentioned, Cinema Comunista, was a film about the abandoned film studios of Yugoslavia, which uh, are in a hill in Belgrade, my hometown. And this is one of the very first images that I filmed when I went there because, again, like every other public institution in Yugoslavia, they were kind of cleansing themselves of Yugoslavia's heritage. And films were being thrown in the garbage and many other things were being thrown in the garbage. And I spent about five years working on that film, um, filming half of the time and taking things out of the garbage half of the time and beginning to constitute a kind of private archive of things that were being, that were being thrown away. And uh, I guess this work on private archives was incredibly inspirational for me because I found this document completely by accident, um, which is a call to the citizens of the newly created Yugoslavia. Now we're jumping back to a previous war, the First World War. It was a call to the Yugoslav public to gather documentation for the history of Yugoslavia's creation. I found it extraordinary because it was the first time I'd seen a document of a country inviting its population to start constituting a national archive. And it takes me back to that building in Washington, D.C., and this idea of how does that national life get created in the first place. And so I didn't translate the whole thing for you because it's obviously very long, but there is this idea that you know, we have a duty to leave to the next generation's documentation about how this country was created. The knowledge is still here in our homes and in our memories. And have everyone note down and send to us what they saw, what they heard, and what they felt during these times. Do not think that what you have is insignificant and that what you know has no significance for history. And so this is the idea that they're the newly created institute of the Yugoslav archive begs all citizens to help it in the gathering of remains, memories, and documentation for our history, which will one day form the basis of our national archive. So I like this idea of looping back to that kind of finality of chiseling a national archive, which we no longer have, obviously, in the former Yugoslavia. But this reflection on our memories, our homes, um, led me to the making of my second film, because my second film takes place inside our family home. And it's a kind of... Um, Unique place because the apartment that we live in is in a building built by my great-grandfather, and my great-grandfather happened to be one of the participants in the creation of the former Yugoslavia, so that's him, the man with his back to us. 
And uh, ever since my birth, we had this image in our house, this framed photograph of the moment of Yugoslavia's creation in 1918, right at the end of the First World War. Um, also as a kind of memory of the fact that there had been a Yugoslavia before the communist Yugoslavia, because obviously with the communist period they had done everything to erase the idea of a Yugoslavia that preceded communism. But what was really striking about this image is that it, it had completely disappeared from public. So when my mother once took me to the hall where this uh, unification had taken place and asked the lady where was the image of the unification, the lady said no such image existed. This is in the late 1980s. And so in my second documentary film called The Other Side of Everything, you actually see the moment where in 2006, workers renovating the old building of the Serbian parliament found the image because it had been actually walled in behind a kind of plaster wall and it had been hidden from you for over about 60 years at that point. So I began to work with this idea of the disappearing image and the reappearing image and how the image of Yugoslavia has always been victim to this cyclical process of erasure and intentional forgetting by every kind of successor government and political regime that, um, that took power. And so the film that I worked on about our family history takes us further than the first film, which is really about communist Yugoslavia, into the second kind of period that I was looking at, which is the 1990s and the breakup of Yugoslavia. And so I began a collection of archives of the resistance to the war in Yugoslavia and the resistance to Milosevic's regime, which had existed in Serbia throughout the 90s, but had never really been documented or preserved. And obviously, because it wasn't something that was ever reported on by state television or state media, the process became asking people who I knew had been in the resistance movement to go down to their basements, pull out old VHS tapes or mini DV tapes, and I made this agreement with them that I would digitize their footage and um, give them a digitized copy in return for rights. And I ended up constituting an archive of about 250 hours of material of the resistance. And I kind of call this the resistant image with this kind of playful idea that um, at some point, I think any of us working on archives in the former Yugoslavia become accidental archivists, if you want. And it's this, really this idea of um, gathering at home, going back to this idea of what we gather in our homes to preserve when in the official public sphere there is no intention to tell the story of our national life. Um, and one other thing that for me was really important was that I turned our domestic space into an archive itself. And I was incredibly inspired by a museum that I visited in Istanbul that was created by the writer Orhan Pamuk when, with the money that he won for, um, that, he, uh, that was part of his Nobel Prize. So he ended up turning his novel into a museum with this incredibly interesting co conceit of turning each chapter of the book into a vitrine in the museum. And for me, it was a really striking example of how um, everyday objects, everyday images, and everyday artifacts can begin to tell um, our story. Loving this idea of Pamuk that we need to start telling stories in the place of histories. And it's really in this domain of telling stories in the place of histories that I worked on the other side of everything because I found this quote that to me really speaks profoundly to the failure of historiography in the former Yugoslavia, which is that if the official truth is static and falsified and not able to accommodate the diversity of lived experience, then the other register of truth, the intimate truth, acknowledges this and creates ways of informal falsification. And so for me, it was really this idea of moving the work that I do with archives from the domain of writing history to the domain of writing story personal stories on a kind of intimate and subjective register of truth, if you want, that I began to situate my work with archives. And then skipping ahead, because we have very little time, it brings us to the project that I was working on here, which is, quoting Walter Benjamin again, <laughs> can anyone work with archives and not quote Walter Benjamin? But um, again, a, a, a quote from him that really speaks to me, which is this idea that history decays into images, not into stories. And going back to the fact that I found myself making my third and actually fourth film because it became a diptych um, about an archive itself. So in my first two films, I was kind of using the archive to try and piece together Yugoslavia's story, but here I actually decided that the focus of the storytelling would be the archive itself. And the archive that I've been working with is an archive that has been completely forgotten and never examined, which is an archive shot by cameramen of Yugoslav newsreels in collaboration and cinematic solidarity with newly created countries in Africa and liberation movements. And so Yugoslav cameramen from the period of mid-1950s to the 1970s made an incredible number of films as a gesture of technical aid of Yugoslavia to countries in the non-aligned movement. 
And the collection is so vast and so unexamined that it's actually taken the last seven years of my life. Um, the result of all of this research has been a web platform that is not online newsreels.com and a kind of archival project with the idea of not only indexing and digitalizing these archives, but finding out ways to project them forward today and to give them a kind of role in the political conversation taking place today, particularly in examining the what is the third world project today, if one can even call it that. Um, and just to finalize, the project has taken many durations. I, in the two years that I spent here at the Institute, it uh, became video installations um, because one element that I've found increasingly interesting is spatial encounters with archives and how they impact um, the, the reading. But also, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to kind of plug this, um, this Sunday, in four days, we will have the world premiere of The Diptych, um, which is now two documentary films, both of which were edited here in the last two years. And as Marie says, the Institute Fellows suffered from watching many, many versions <laughs> of the cuts of these two films. Um, but essentially, one tells the story of the birth of the non online movement through the archive that we found uh, filmed in many newly independent countries in Africa. The second one tells a, a, a kind of sub-chapter of the larger story, which is the story of the use of cinema during the Algerian War of Liberation, because I was fortunate enough to meet the man who was the cameraman of Yugoslav President Tito. I spent three years filming with him and discovered that he had been sent on a secret mission by the president to film for the Algerian liberation movement and spent three years uh, shooting a total of 83 kilometers of footage for them. But also then it ended up, went on filming, uh, making the first documentary film for Frelimo in Mozambique in 1967 and then, 1969, sorry, and then in 1971 making one of the first films about the PLO and Yasser Arafat called Blood and Tears. So it's this kind of tradition of cinematic solidarity, if you want, that again has never been told, not even to my generation of people who grew up in the former Yugoslavia, but today remains a totally unknown chapter of Yugoslavia's um, relationship with um, the non-aligned world. And uh, my hope is that with the release of these two films, we will at least begin to resituate that archive in some kind of public memory, at least in the former Yugoslavia, if nowhere else. To leave the screen on. Um, I mean, I, I am the, I guess, the unofficial moderator because the <laughs> instigator of this. I mean, it's um, what strikes me is in all of our cases, there's a, a sort of a, a touchstone between the official and the familial, or the official, and the personal, as you said, history and story. Um, it's also interesting to me that it, it, it's, it, it works across genres and discipline. It strikes me that your interests are of a different historical scale, let's say, than mine. What I was looking at was the registration of political histories in an architectural history. But that seems, I'm, 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 I'm curious if you guys would want to talk about the, the genesis of that interest in your work because um, the, you know, there is, there's a historical tradition of doing that. I know well, the names of the people that I read when I was in school starting in the, you know, in the 60s, rethinking the idea of history at a large scale. But uh, I'm just, if you want to. <laughs> so in my case, it's it's interesting because I keep going back and forth to these scenes. So my first book is actually about former Portuguese political prisoners, and it came out zero reading, but just coming out of high school and as starting as a photographer, I realized how my colleagues and my friends in high school absolutely knew nothing about what had went on. And to me, I felt somehow connected and responsible for these stories. Obviously, it's my family and a lot of friends of the family and a lot of stories that I grew up with. So I started going to them and one inter interviewing them and wanting to make a book out of it, which I eventually did. And that took seven years. And then at the same time, I started, or a little later, but I started 
a, a project about Operation Condor and the military dictatorships in South America, which took nine years of my life. And then I just decided I couldn't do it. I'm like, I can't keep on going to cover six countries which are like the size of a continent and I need to focus much shorter, much shorter term, shorter energy, sh like everything needs to be much more concise. And I have decided to go back to my own family history and go back to this amazing place where I've never been. And I've never been on purpose. I had been to Cape Verde once before starting this project and on purpose I didn't go to this island because I knew the day I was going to go there something was going to happen. And so I waited for that uh, moment and I waited for very practical reasons because I did Condor for nine years and a big part of why it took nine years was funding. Uh, I couldn't find money so I had eventually even to crowdfund for it. Uh, as I started in photojournalism and documentary photography and all the the magazines just started shrinking, uh, nobody would assign me. So I decided I would only start to Rafal if I had the project funded. Uh, so whenever I thought I was ready, I started applying to grants and I eventually got two small, well, not small, but I got a small grant and a major one that gave me the resources to go and start. Uh, and so when I started, I knew that I could, I would have the resources to do it and just do that. Uh, so obviously my connection to this project was much more intense because I'm pretty much only doing this for the last three years uh, with a pandemic in the middle, which actually served a great purpose of time to reflect and think and not being being able to travel halfway around the world to do whatever. So yeah, the Institute played that role too of giving me a, a, a route and an anchor to, to be here. Uh, so yeah, it's been mixed and all these mixes of like branching out to history and thinking of history, but not from a theoretical perspective. I've like, until recently, I had not read enough, or I think I still haven't read enough about all those back references. And I keep going to it and reading it and sort of discovering new things and new approaches, which some of them I have intuitively approached and others I have not. And it's interesting to keep discovering new things and images that you've made sometimes 20 years ago. And that's the archive inside of the archive and reinterpreting that, yeah. Very similar. I mean, if, if you're asking about Genesis, I, I would say it just came from a place of anger. I was incredibly angry um, that there was this willful dismantling and destruction and throwing away. And I just had this feeling that if we never broke that cycle because, um, you know, when communists came to power in 1945, they erased the existence of the previous Yugoslavia because it had been a monarchy. And then when Milosevic came to power in 1990, he erased the existence of Yugoslavia, making way for, you know, his vision of Serbia. But then when we had a democratic revolution in 2000 and got rid of Milosevic, finally, we actually erased the 1990s. You ask kids today what happened in the 1990s and particularly what was Serbia's role in it, they have never been told that story. And so, you know, by the time I started Cinema Comunista, um, it was 2005, there was just this anger at this kind of cyclical um, c uh, cycle that we were locked into as a society and, and, uh, and, and a need for someone to save some of that past so that, you know, each next generation could at least be told a story, not the story, but a story, and um, and have some kind of ar archive with which to. Uh, and in every, in the case of every project that I've done, I have always filmed much more than what I needed for the film. In the case of Cinema Comunista, it was because I knew with the film studio that I was the last person who was ever going to film there, and I was after it, it was destroyed. And so I filmed, I, I did detailed documentation, filmed documentation of the costume depot, of the um, props depot, of you know, it, it was just this idea of there's this awareness that you are also c creating an archive by doing this work. With the other side of everything, it was this gathering of the VHS tapes that had started to rot. So the project itself always surpasses the final result, which is a film, just a film if you like. But where I completely kind of 
overlap with Joao is it's e in every case it's taken five years, seven years. It's you know it's these things where you dive in and you come out middle-aged or like even <laughs> you know further at this point at this point further than middle-aged. But there's and, and there is this idea of how many of these can I do in my life um, and kind of feeling like you that I'm at the end of my ability to work like this. You know, to give this much of my time and of my life to um, to propping up something that should be propped up with by society, not by artists, essentially. You know, so it's anger. It's really sheer anger. I, I don't know how other to describe the emotion. So it's not from an intellectual. Pla this is where I think it's not from an intellectual place at all. And the theoretical reading, yes, it, it's always two years later that I find the quote that would have been really useful to help me understand what I'm doing, but. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't start with Walter Benjamin, <laughs> no. right? I mean, maybe I did when I was in graduate school, but um, I mean, I think, you know, for me, entering the materials that I worked with as a practicing architect mm -hmm. rather than as an architectural historian led me to value them very differently. And I had, you know, I had some responses that were like, why are you talking about window frames? It's banal, it's obvious, um, of course, West Germany went from a place of lesser means and poverty of means to uh, you know, a kind of embarrassment of riches. Of course, they followed an American model on that, but there was such a dismissiveness about the actual effort and achievement and thought and nuance and differentiation. And honestly, architecture, if it does anything, it represents. And the disappearance of the Hans Wippert, the, the two primary buildings of his career, the parliament building that was built in 1949, and this cathedral that was, you know, the, the symbol of Catholicism in an otherwise, you know, party line atheistic country, mm -hmm. they are both gone. And the only reason that my own slightly amateurish photographs entered the book when I had two wonderful photo photographers to work with is because there was nothing left to mm -hmm. photograph just years after I'd been there. So, you know, my, my, sense, my sense of loss is not at the scale of national history writ large, but at the scale of the effacement of, natural hi of, of national history in, in the artifact, mm -hmm. which is also sort of goes back to this idea of the archive. Yeah, and I think in the case of the three of us is this sense of urgency, right? Uh, the sense of urgency that something is disappearing and how can you hold on to that as a lifeboat in a way and like ship it on to whatever comes next. And I think that's a really interesting uh, engine because from my experience, and I'm sure you both have the same, like then there's someone who picks up on that and keeps on going towards their own direction. But it, that's where I find it very, very inspiring. I remember when I did Condor, so my second book, uh, I launched it in Brazil. It was my first book launch was in Brazil. And my dream, I'm not an historian, I'm not an academic, I don't have, I never went to graduate school. I never did any of that. And I do the book lounge and the first book lounge, there's two people who approach and they were history teachers and say, I'm going to use this in my classroom. And that to me was like, wow. Uh, and it, my first book the same was like, instead of having it in the photo section, it was picked up by FNAC in the history section. And to me, that is really, really where I think I would like to be in that sense of like playing with languages and just bridging them between different uh, disciplines. And I think your work does that, and I think your work does that. And that's really an interesting thing because then others can reappropriate that and re-archive that into different directions. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would want to add is that I think that that kind of work also pushes back against a conventional understanding of what an archive is. Um, I've had the experience now with two different, let's say, minor figures of modern architecture where the archives were entirely intact, everything from drawings, letters, Christmas cards sent. Architects send each other Christmas cards and they're remarkable little time capsules, right? And to convince a university library or a museum to take it all 
and not to pick and choose when what is special is not you know not the not the selection but all of it right and i and i and i feel like what you're saying and is what is special today might not be special in 50 that's years so and so vice true. versa that's, yeah, that's the so to true. me as a photographer is the the magic of re-editing going back to the material and re-looking at it um, Marie, you'll let us know when you'd like us to open the floor to questions, yeah? Yeah. So. Could, I just have a request. Can you tell that funny story of the guy who, at the Condor opening, gave you the folder? Speaking of archives, never ended. Oh, yeah, well, but that's the story of my life. Because I always try to finish the projects, and in my head they're finished. And then when you launch a book on when you do the exhibition, it's when the public sees it for the first time. So for you is old, I'm sure, for, like, I'm sure Mila, every time the film gets projected, she just runs out of the room. <laughs> to me, it's the same. Like, I can no longer bear of looking at those photographs, speaking about those photographs, because it's been so long. Uh, and what keeps happening is whenever I open a show or I do a book lounge, and this one was in Paraguay, there's someone who just comes to me and say, I want you to have this, and hands me a folder of top secret documents that he was <laughs> keeping it for the last 40 years, and I'm like, but the book is done. What am I gonna do with this? So it's this grow, and it's a problem. It's like these growing archives that you keep, and then a university, whatever, other people should be able to wor keep working with it. I can't, I'm like, I only have one life to live, and like the day only has 24 hours. So I have, I have a happy institute story. When I did my fellows talk, it was at, in the middle, not just of COVID, but in the 12-hour curfew in Paris. And because of that, it was in the afternoon and set up so that people could listen internationally. And the archivist with whom I had always been in contact in Munich for my book was able to listen in. And a day later, she wrote me an email and said, because one of the points I made was that although Sepp Roof's daughters had saved everything, Hans Schrippert's, much of his archive, his office archive was missing because the bequest came from his professorship, not from his professional office. And she wrote me an email and said, you know, we have about 25 job books in the basement from Hans Schrippert's office. Do you think you'd like to see them the next time you come? <laughs> so that, for me, that was an opening, but um, I can see how it could be a burden as well. No, so. It is an opening, but it's, <laughs> sometimes it's too much of an opening. <laughs> how, do you make a, how do you make a distinction between archives and personal collections? You know, because for me, uh, I mean, an archive is something that's already constituted, has, whoops, that has already, you know, ha had people go through it, organize it, and so on and so forth. And you, you all seem to be betwixt and between the personal family collection as opposed to an archival collection. I don't know. I mean, I just would love to understand a little bit what you mean by archives when you say archives. So in the case of the work that I was doing, it's slightly different because most of the material was coming from an ordered collection to right. begin with, right. right? It was put together to you know, sustain an architectural office, which has legal demands on it, where things have to be kept for a certain amount of time, or it was coming from a professorship. The difference was that it hadn't been inventoried in the place that it was being kept. So I had the experience of going to the German National Museum in Nuremberg and saying I was interested in something and the archivist actually saying to me, well, let's grab a wagon, we'll go down in the basement and you can point to what you want. Mm -hmm. And then I asked, well, but how am I supposed to cite it? And they said, well, you can just say it was in the binder that said House of Parliament, right? So it, it was a kind of inter in interstice between these two things. Mm -hmm. And the experience that I had is that usually these bequests, when they're taken whole hog, are so vast mm -hmm. that the actual act of inventorying is something that is put off many, many years in the future, which also means that they're closed to a certain kind of scholarship. Mm -hmm. And one has to be willing to engage in a different kind of relationship with the material and a different, 
um, certainty of what a source means in order to get over that hurdle. But for me, that was productive. But I think the distinction you're making is a true one. I'll, I'll add on to that just to answer the, the notion of archive. And I'll, I'll do a very brief uh, tale of what my 20 years of looking in archives in many, many countries is. So for this one was easy because it was just sitting there waiting for me. But there's been archives where I have actually to go through archivists and explain them what I'm looking for. And again, most of them are used to paper and words, not so much to images. And I remember I was in Argentina and they have quite a, uh, an interesting archive of just before the dictatorship, uh, all the prisoners that were being taken in already for political reasons. Uh, and I'm not going to make a history class about Argentina here, but they had some images that were very interesting. But they required me because of identity and preservation of identity. And Argentina, there's 30,000 people have been disappeared and hundreds of thousands that went to prison. Uh, and they requested me in order to reproduce the images. The words were fine, the images, because of preserving the identity, I would have to have written permission by, from everyone in the photographs. And I'm like, okay, but this person might be disappeared. Oh, you need to find their relatives and have them. I'm like, seriously? Yes. So from 120, I found one. I got to Paraguay, crossing the border, went to Paraguay, where they actually have six tons of archive material that they found in the 90s, including the famous Archives of Terror, where it shows all in the Operation Condor. And I was ready for this approach because, again, an archivist, right? So I get there at seven in the morning, start speaking to the director of the archive. In, first of all, she would, she, the meeting was inside of the archive, so we had all the shelves around us. Like, so I'm doing this, I want images, that, that, and that. Like, sure. Like, what do you mean, sure? <laughs> can I make, the, yeah. Like, when can I come? Do I need to write a letter to Pope Francis or something like that? No, 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 you can start, it's here. What do you mean it's here? It's here. We're, there's like 100,000 images there. There's the albums there. You can just start. It's like, are you sure? It's like, yeah. So this idea of archive and the way people take care of archives really depends on the systems where they are built. And this is why it's very important. Because if it's the United States, they approach it in one way. France might approach it another way. Portugal or Paraguay or Argentina. So it depends who you are. It depends who you're talking to and depends how charming you can be to convince them to give you access and time. So it, it is very malleable, and therefore it is very complicated to work with. So to me, I approach it as not as an archive, but as a document. And that document can be family, can be anonymous, can be historical, can be public. It doesn't matter, but it's what that, those images will tell me and will help me to tell the story. That's how I, I see it. I guess for me it's similar um, in the sense that, I, and I go back to that word permanency, I think for us the verb to archive, there's this idea of you take something and you put it in a folder and that's where it, it will remain forever. It has been archived and you take a reel of film and you put it on that shelf labeled under that name and that's where it will be. And for me, I think my work with archives has gone back to challenge that very idea that you can archive something. There is nothing permanent or stable or unchanging about things that have been archived. So even the indexes, you know, and so for me, the archive is a living, breathing thing. To the and I'll give you just a few examples of, of how that works. You, you go into an archive and uh, there's something that is in, the in it, it has been indexed, for example. The Yugoslav newsreels, let's say that they had indexed their materials at some point. During the war in the 90s, um, because we were under an embargo and all sorts of things were difficult, you would have people who would cut things out of the material, put them in their pockets and take them home to sell them in the black market. So something is indexed and archived, but it actually doesn't exist anymore. Or for example, I was looking for my first film for uh, archive materials of some event that had happened in Sarajevo, contacted the television station in Sarajevo, it had been bombed during the war, but I found a copy of it in the BBC archive. And then you have these incredibly interesting situations where the rights owner doesn't have the footage, but the person who has the footage doesn't have the rights. <laughs> and you can't actually get the material until you find a way for the two of them to communicate and for the rights holder 
to tell the other that they're okay with you using something that is actually not in their collection. So all of these kinds of cases where, for, for me, the, what I find really fascinating, I find it incredibly Western, actually, this idea of an archive as a permanent, stable place, um, which is why you'd understand quickly that I don't situate Serbia in the West at all. Uh, it, because I think our archival practices speak volumes about our society, I really do, you know, and our archival practice at the moment in Serbia is in shambles. We don't actually have one. Um, it happened to me with the other side of everything, this is why I mentioned this idea of becoming an accidental archivist, which is what I think all of us who have a research component to our practice end up becoming ultimately, is what do you do with the archive you have constituted, which is indexed and sorted and labeled and organized, and ultimately I was contacted by one institution, um, offering to take over this archive that I had gathered of the resistance movement in Serbia in the 90s, but that institution was the Central European University. So outside of Serbia, first of all, which I'm not sure that I find is the right solution for this archive, but secondly, the Open Society archives of the Central European University are politically under attack in Hungary. So the idea of st you know having a stable home for that kind of archive also evaporates due to the current political changing situation. So I think for me, I just gave up any idea that you know, to archive is to in ensure something stable and permanent with the material that you're working with. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, Bill. I had a question that I think builds um, straight on, on what you just said, because um, what kind of is paradoxical or maybe ironic is that you are trying to preserve archives by putting stuff in some form, using some medium, that has very often the same form of what has just been destroyed, whether it's the, the films that have been thrown into the garbage. So film is used to archive, uh, create a new archive, or a book, I mean, which is a rather old-fashioned medium <laughs> these <laughs> days, but it seems to be much more able to preserve a form for posterity than our digital, I digital images or such. So I'm, I was thinking about two dimensions of this question. What does it take to, to, to archive the form, mm -hmm. the medium that you're choosing, and what how, how do you select it? I mean, it comes may maybe from your profession, your background, but for example, for a photographer, why a book, right? I mean, that <laughs> is sort of a, a question of an architect. One could also think this is a way would be to, you know, create new models of these things, or there are other ways in which you could preserve. And this, the other question that I was sort of, I'm not sure it's directly related, but has a similar flavor is where, where to preserve? And I think the question of centralization versus decentralization, which also goes to the family archives versus the state archives, what is official, what is not, um, plays a role here. Because in some ways, I think from network theory, one would say actually decentralized preservation makes much more sense. And while I respect that you can't shoulder this on your own, I think these are wonderful examples that you lived and are living for us of having a rather resilient network of decentralized archives that if we knew in the future how to ac access them would give us so much more information than going to the National Archive in DC. I, uh, to your first point, I think it's really, it's an it's incredibly pertinent remark, which is that I'm actually not sure that what I'm doing is preserving the life of films, because in terms of physical support, uh, film has been proven to last 100 years. A hard drive will never last 100 years. So in, in essence, I actually think those of us who are working in digital media, I think our era of artistic creation will be exactly like the era of nitrate film. I think actually there will be a hole in the history of cinema, which will be our digital age. I actually don't think it will survive. I don't think our creation will survive. And now there's a process of um, the European um, Film Academy is now trying to create grants so that filmmakers ultimately make one film copy of their film, so that there is actual, so that we now start preserving our digital work on film because we know celluloid can last 100 years and nothing else for the moment exists to preserve cinema that can last 100 years. So I actually think it's an incredibly interesting question, but it's actually such a defeatist question that I prefer not to think about it. I just know, <laughs> I know that one day the hard drives on which all of these archives that I have gathered are kept will die. I know that. And so the question is, you can't keep eternally buying new hard drives and copying, I actually don't know what to do to give that archive a longevity. Well, uh, speaking from a photographer's perspective, uh, it's very complicated, but I am the one that keeps buying new hard drives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am the one who spends much <laughs> of my savings in hard drives and new technology, but at the same time, it's one of the reasons why I went back to the dark room, is like printing 
uh, and so for this uh, work in specific, I actually decided to print four copies of the images. One to be given back to the families. Uh, second one, to so I keep to myself. A third one, eventually, and I need to discuss this with my own family because it's our archives, to be given to the National Archives. In the case of Portugal, and the, being a country with 900 years of history, we do have actually a pretty interesting National Archives, which obviously cannot hold all the materials that they have. So when I went there to look for these materials, and uh, because I have very good relationships with them, they were like, João, we have hundreds of boxes from the post-revolution period that we have never touched. We have no idea what's in it. Do you want to take a look? <laughs> and no, I did. And so I am sort of like an unpaid collaborator of the Portuguese National Archives, which I have, I have this great access whenever I, there's something that I'm looking at and like, okay, here are the boxes, sort it out. Then we sorted out the rights, and then I give them, because I do reproduce them on a digital form, I give them, that's the trade-off. I'll give them the, the scans for free, and I'll have those scans for myself too. But then, again, and going back to you, archival materials and the posteriority of it, we know a fiber print, a silver gelatin print, rightly taken care of, can last at least 200 years. That's why we keep looking at old photographs and they're still there. Uh, and yeah, uh, so I try to think, obviously not at everything that I do I'll print, but I try to think as the, what I imagine to be historically relevant work that I want to have it in printed form, in archival form, kept somewhere. But then one day there's a flood or a earthquake, and what happens to that? <laughs> That's where digital is really good because you can mo make multiple copies and have one here, one in the United States, one in Portugal, and that's where I spend all my money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what it sort of points to is an embrace of shape-shifting, right? That, that it's not just the multiple, but also the, the, um, the, the manifold of like what kind of discipline you work in. It, it took a long time um, for architects to, to come to terms with the fact that the only product of their effort or the only practices within their disciplines are not just drawing or not just being the master of the works. Um, so for me, what was, uh, a kind of an interesting insight, especially around Hans Rippert, who I think is such a fascinating character. Um, you know, a man who, for his own uh, purposes, foregrounded modesty, foregrounded a very intimate relationship with the people who made things, but he was the head of the German Werkbund after the war, and he was the one who was negotiating between designers, government, industry, and economic the export industry, right? So he had these many aspects to him. What is so strange is that what surprise survives of his work is not the building, right? We think of buildings as having the greatest of longevities. Um, you know, I, I'm in the field of sustainability and one of the comments that Zoe's made is we need to stop worrying about new building because 95% of the structures and infrastructures that are going to be here in 50 years already exist. Right, we need to come to terms with that. But at the same time, you know, I'm a New Yorker. My city has cannibalized itself mm -hmm. five times since my birth. Um, and in a way, there are parts of the architecture that ha can only survive in these different media. And to me, it's fascinating, for example, that a telegram survives, but the physical camp is in disarray, right? Or that. Mm -hmm. The story of your family survives even though the building in which that history occurred has been subdivided and subjected to so many different iterations, right? So think, thinking more broadly about this idea of t things taking different forms and questioning which is the one that has the greatest longevity is maybe a, a not a bad way to go about it. Hi, it's a logistical question. Where are your two films uh, being shown? 
Oh, um, at the moment, it's only we only have the world premiere figured out, which is this weekend in Amsterdam and the Serbian and the Algerian, but there will be a screening in Paris in March okay. and in New York at Columbia University in March as well. Okay. Um, but it's only just starting its festival circuit. So the easiest thing to do is look at the website. There's a newsletter, and we will we'll be sending out information about the screenings as everything starts falling into place. Okay, thanks.